So to start, I'm a transgender woman. I'm single, and I make my status as trans very clear on all my dating profiles, except Plenty of Fish. They consider that to be talking about sex, and they'll straight up ban you, so I state instead that I'm a huge proponent of trans rights. So this guy messages me. He lives about an hour away, and kind of cute in a mildly creepy way, like something seems a little bit off about him, but people can't help how they look, so I decided I'd give him a chance, just like I would want someone to do to me. I discover he's a smoker, but he says he's trying hard to quit and only does when he's stressed or upset. We have a nice conversation, and finally he asks for my number. Without thinking about it, I give him the number, but tell him I'm getting ready for my evening classes, so I'll be a bit slow to respond. A few minutes go by and I get, Hi, it's me from Plenty of Fish. Usually I send a standard quick message. Hi, it's Ali. And so, just to be clear, since my profile might be a little vague, I'm a transgender woman. I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, so if you're not interested, I completely understand. About 20% of the time, the guy isn't interested, gets rude, and needs to be blocked. The other 80% is split between immediate inappropriate questions and dick pics, casual acceptance, or just dead silence after. But like I said, I was getting ready to go to class, so I hadn't sent any message yet. A few minutes go by, and I'm about to text him my standard, when I get another text. Who the fuck is full dead name? Why is he paying your cell phone bill? Where did you even get that name? Answer the question, who is he? I'm honestly stunned at this point. I realize he must have paid for one of those shady websites that offer personal info for a fee. Well, if you must know, I'm transgender and that used to be my name. I was about to tell you when you pulled that stunt, so please do us both a favor and lose my number. That's incredibly invasive and I don't want to talk to you anymore. Do you still live at my address at the time? In hometown? I'm coming to see you right now so we can talk about this in person. No, I moved a few months ago, and I'm getting ready to head out like I said, so you need to leave me alone. Don't contact me again. Since you have something to hide, I'm going to run a full background check on you. You lied to me, and I don't appreciate that. I'm sending screen caps of this conversation, your POF profile, and your photos to my two best friends who work in law enforcement. My ex-boyfriend, who I'm still on good terms with, works for the local sheriff's office too, so don't text me again. I didn't hear anything else from him for a few weeks. I made sure my doors and windows were locked, and the aforementioned friends and ex would come check up on me from time to time. Eventually, it just became one of those weird things that makes you laugh uneasily. Then one day, though, I thought I saw him at the local grocery store. Same dark hair. Thick glass frames and just creepy guys staring at me, watching me the whole time as I shopped. I texted my ex about it, and as an upswing on things, my ex and I got back together in a casual sort of way. He stayed the night a few times a month on and off. One night while I was alone, though, I just kept getting this weird feeling and smelling smoke. I lived in a little apartment complex that was three separate apartments that shared walls, but no plumbing or air ducts. I don't smoke, and I'm very sensitive to the smell thanks to asthma. The apartment had a wall AC unit, so I turned it off since it was apparently pulling air in from the neighbor's guest, who must have been chain smoking, or so I thought. I had an ASL video due the next morning, so I was up all night practicing and recording the video signing the same story over and over, until it was almost a dance rather than a narration. A couple of times I had to restart the video because my cat was just going nuts. Finally, around 7am, I had the video finished and sent in, and was ready for bed. I double checked all the doors and windows were locked, set an alarm and went to sleep. I woke up and got ready for school, was running a bit late and had to hurry out the door, but I noticed something weird. I didn't have time to stop and register it though. 
and classes went smoothly, got an A on my ASL video, and I stopped for groceries on my way home from class. As I got home, though, I saw what had been bugging me. Each apartment had a small garden on each side of the porch. Mine was nothing but gravel and pavers that the previous tenant had put in, but it was all tidy, except for a pile of cigarette butts that looked like someone had dumped their car ashtray right in my garden. And there was no other trash, just that pile right in front of my bedroom window. I didn't think anything about it at first and just get a broom and dustpan and sweep it up. As I'm doing it, my neighbor, an old man, comes out and asks if my boyfriend ever managed to get a hold of me. I ask him what he means. He tells me that there was a young man waiting for me on my front porch for a few hours last night, that he'd seen the man around the area before and just assumed that he was my boyfriend. I asked him what he looked like. Dark hair, thick glasses, chain smoking. I text the on and off again ex. Cops take statements and I give them the screenshots. I moved out of state a few weeks later for unrelated reasons and I've legally changed my name since with closed records. I don't give guys my number anymore. Ladies and my fellow queer family, you use a texting app until you get to know someone because for like five dollars, creeps can get everything just from your number. This is my first post, and I don't know how to approach telling the story, so I apologize if this comes out a bit unorganized. I've been going to therapy for about a month now, and in receiving therapy, I've been revisiting past experiences and finally leaving them to rest. One of the memories is from when I was about eight years old. I was living in a rural area, my house facing a cemetery, with more graves than the inhabitants of the town I lived in. It was a quiet and peaceful place, a place of serene silence. About nine or ten blocks from the north side of the cemetery is a secluded creek which leads off to a forest area. I had two very close friends. Sarah was my age, Daniel two years older than us. Daniel had two cousins, one of which was old enough to drive. One slow, hot Saturday afternoon, Danny's cousin suggested we go out, get ice cream, and drive up to the lake. We all hopped in the pickup truck, Danny and his younger cousin riding in the bed, Sarah and I in the back seat. We passed into a small store, picking up ice cream, bottled water, and fruits. Ice creams in hand, windows rolled down, and classic rock from the radio had all hyped us up for a swim. In all this excitement, though, we made a wrong turn and found ourselves at a lesser used path to the creek. The older cousin didn't feel like driving more, so we decided to take our things and wait our feet in the creek. We hopped out, and immediately I begun to get this strange feeling in my back. I could feel my hair standing on end, slight discomfort washing all over my body. We began to walk down the path, Danny chasing Sarah under the threat of getting a bug on her. I tried to shake the feeling off, instead enjoying the crisp air and the sound of running water. After a good seven minute walk, we reached a large rock where we settled our things and stepped out into the creek. We splashed around, collecting rocks that shone brilliantly under the water, oblivious to the rest of the world. I decided to walk up to the rock, because I began to crave some watermelon. As I sat down, it hit me. The uncomfortable wave washed over me, an intense feeling that I can only describe as being vulnerable. It was as if I was completely naked, being stripped from all form of innocence and safety. I could feel eyes on my back. I decided to turn around, fear-stricken. At first, I couldn't make out anything. I couldn't tell why I had felt so paranoid. But after looking for a while, I saw something shiny reflecting a light. It was brief and small. I thought maybe it was a littered bottle or a piece of trash lying on the ground. 
I could hear Dan calling for me to come back down. I rushed my way down and joined the group. I told the older cousin that I had spotted something weird, but that I was too scared to go and check it out. He told me to ignore it. It was probably just trash. But even with that, I still felt like something was wrong. We climbed back up to the rock, hydrating and eating between chats and giggles. The older cousin had his back to the creek, where he had a clear view of the same area I looked into. I had nearly forgotten all about my feeling when he stopped suddenly. His smile was gone, face pale, placing his bottle down. Immediately, he stood up and began to shout, Hey, who's there? We all turned to look and saw someone shoot out of the weeds. It looked to be a man, and he ran with something in his hands. He started saying that the man looked like he was taking pictures of us with one hand. All the blood drained from my head. The fear that I hadn't spotted the man first washing over me. How long had he been there? And had he been following us since we started the walk-in? We packed up and left, trying to forget this uncomfortable experience. It wasn't until two weeks after that, when the town was buzzing over finding a dead body in the creek. We were friendly with the caretaker of the cemetery, which was the cemetery chosen for the burial of the body after he was identified. He told all of us that the victim was a teenager who was killed and dumped at the creek a week ago, leaving a disfigured, half-bloated, and rotting mess. The murderer was a creepy middle-aged man who lived closer to the forested area. His cabin-like house was searched, and they found toys, collected missing children's clippings from newspapers, and hundreds of pictures of families which focused always on the kids and pictures of the teenagers that hung out there after school. Sometimes I shudder at the thought that it was very possible that that was the same man who was at that creek, and that it could have been all of us instead. So this happened about two days ago and talking about it still makes me uncomfortable. I'm 18 years old, and I love camping. A group of friends and I decided that because we're all locked up because of the corona, we would go ahead and go on a hiking slash camping trip. We go hiking very frequently, and we like to divvy up the tasks for what to bring. You bring food, he brings water, you bring batteries and fire stuff, whatever. My job was to bring the water this time. I had an extra pack of Dasani water bottles, and before I left, I set them on my kitchen counter so I wouldn't forget them. An hour later, I was driving with my windows down, music blaring out my car, when I realized I'd left the damn water on the counter. I was the water guy, so I had to deliver, obviously, because water is essential. I thought, no big deal. I'll just stop at a gas station, and so I did. Now at the gas station, they were all out of packs of Dasani, and only had Deer Park water. I hate it because it has a weird taste to me, but I wasn't about to show up with no water. This is an important detail for later, so remember that Deer Park water. We all arrive at the park, and tell one of the park rangers where we're going, and that we're going to start a campfire. We travel really far out to this one secret camp spot we go to all the time. This spot is so fucking far off the trail that the only way you could find it is if you were strapped to a deer and the deer ran off into the sunset for about two hours. Anyways, we hike out to the spot, enjoying nature and setting up all our supplies. We pitch our tents and get the campfire ready. Everyone starts drinking, except for me because I don't drink. Even if I wanted to, I had an online exam the next day, and I just didn't want to deal with the consequences of all that. There's this pretty swimming area near our campsite, and we all want to hike up to it, so we finalize our setting up and off we go. Now everyone is having a fun time by that point, and everyone starts swimming, when I see what looks to be the outline of a guy and his dog looking off in our direction. Now like I said, this spot is in the middle of butt-fuck-nowhere, so it honestly creeped me out a bit to see someone I didn't recognize. 
He disappeared, though, over a ridge, as fast as he had showed up. Eventually, I just forgot about it. A while later, it starts getting dark, so we all get out and decide to go back. When we get back, I have this uneasy feeling, but I can't put my finger on it. Everyone starts drinking more, and they're all pretty out of it at that point. One of my friends goes back to get a bottle of water. He gulps it down, but complains that it tastes bitter as shit. I look over, and the sight I see makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It was Dasani. Hey, where the fuck did you get that? Uh, the cooler you brought with all the water. I ran over to the cooler, and it was completely full of Dasani water bottles. None of the water I brought was in there. I ran back to where everyone was at, and asked if anyone else had brought water. They were all very adamant that they did not, so I refused to let anyone drink from the mysterious new source. Now my friend that drank the water started acting really strange, like he was super drunk. It didn't match up with the amount that he had consumed, though. He's a good 190 plus pounds, and he'd only drunk about two beers, definitely not enough to get you blackout drunk. Eventually, he just slumped over and passed out. Me, being as paranoid as I was, I checked his pulse and breathing. He was fine, just knocked unconscious. I wanted to bring him back down the mountain to get help, but I was in no way prepared to carry him down alone, especially not in the pitch blackness, mind you. My friends were in no state to offer a helping hand either. I told my friends this whole situation was just plain weird, and that my passed out friend might be hurt. They said he'd just had too much to drink, which I knew wasn't true. I took the water bottles and put them away from the campsite, so nobody would grab one and drink it. I didn't pour them out, because I wanted to keep at least one of them in case the water was drugged or something. I wanted proof for the police. As everyone fell asleep, I went back to get the bottles to keep in my tent so I wouldn't forget about it in the morning. When I got back to the spot, though, another chill went down my spine. All of the bottles were gone. After I walked back into the warm light of the campfire, I sat there with a the knife in my hands all night, not even closing my eyes to blink. That was the longest and scariest night of my life. When the sun finally came up and my friends were awake, they were all fine, and we just went home. My friend that drank the water was also fine, but he couldn't remember anything that happened that night. I told them all what happened, of course, but they brushed it off and said I was just trying to scare them that night as a joke. Some of my friends saw how shaken up I was and said they believed me, but they said since everyone's fine and no one was hurt, we should just count our blessings and go home. I had no evidence because the bottles were gone, so I've just dropped it, but I wanted to get this out there because I need to vent. It's crazy to think how my little mistake of forgetting the Dasani water bottles before camping might have prevented us from drinking the sketchy water bottles that my one friend did. My best guess is someone, possibly the guy I saw at the watering hole, drugged our water to rob us, or maybe something even worse. Just make sure you're all safe, especially when camping, and to the person in the woods out in the middle of nowhere that tried to drug me and my friends. Let's not meet. So I was a college student back in 2009-2010. I can't remember the exact year. Anyway, I was introduced to a friend of an acquaintance while in the cafeteria one day. The guy was skinny. Dark-skinned, wore glasses, and kind of looked like a nerd in a pretentious, rich gangster kind of way. He usually wore button-up, short-sleeved shirts, tucked into a pants with a belt. You'd probably have to meet him to get the image. The first thing he does after introducing himself to me and chatting a bit about random things, such as our goals for the future, if I remember right, is to try to inundate me with all kinds of information about the Jewish Torah and how all religion is basically fake. He told me all about how the Bible and other religious books were bastardizations of this and how the definitions changed the meaning of everything, mostly about the different names for God or the Lord and how it pertained to different entities. I found him interesting, 
but at the time I was in an atheistic phase and wasn't all that interested. It rubbed me the wrong way for some reason I couldn't explain, almost like cognitive dissonance. Also, I forgot to mention that the very first thing he did was introduce himself under a false name from a nation, Judea or something similar. We exchanged numbers and talked. One of the first things I noticed about this guy was how controlling and kind of manipulative he was. He would say things like, If you want to be my friend, you've got to be this sort of way. Or, You can't eat certain foods because our way of life forbids it. He really wanted me on board with his religious thing for some reason. He would offer advice and help about things too, like romantic problems. He would end up being the first person I ever truly got drunk with, which was ironically a fun time. One of the things I learned very early on about this guy was that when he wasn't harping on about religious rules and stuff like that, that he was one of the funnest people I knew. He knew how to party, how to socially connect with people, and some conversations we had were very interesting. So we became the kind of friends that talk on the phone often. But one of the other things I noticed about him was he had this very creepy Jim Jones slash Charles Manson kind of ability to make people listen to him and believe everything he told them. It was very unsettling. I was well aware of his propensity towards manipulation quite early on, but for some reason I felt obligated to hang out with him until, of course, it became sort of a friendship. My strangest friendship ever. Another creepy thing about him is that he would somehow always show up when I'd least expect or want him to be there. I would turn my head and boom, he'd be there. I was always super careful not to talk about him very loudly, because he would do this quite often. Once when I was walking with my mom, and I really did not want to introduce them but had to anyway. By then, I already knew he was a sociopath and a narcissist. He had no empathy for anyone at all, and would stroke his own ego all day long. He was incredibly vain, and took all kinds of useless supplements for no real apparent reason. When we were on the phone, he would tell me things about how the different names for God aforementioned were actually about aliens. He said humans were designed to mine for gold because it would make aliens immortal. The story he would try to sell me on would change many times over the course of our friendship, depending on what he was into. It would go from Jewish to Jamaican, then to Egyptian, and then to something else I can't remember. Sometimes it would have elements of spirituality in it. Others, he would say that after we die, that's it. He'd talk about how beings lived in the sun and under the moon, and how light was fake and only dark light existed. Then he'd talk about how I should put together all of my college loan money with his, so we could buy a house near the beach and we could live it up down there. Like I'd fall for that. Anyway, we meet these girls and he wants to show me how easy college girls are. He starts chatting up this girl and her friend, who happens to be a lesbian. Their relationship is short-lived. It's mostly because she said he had a temper and was too controlling. She's the one who told me his real name, because she ended up seeing his ID card. So this guy gets the idea that he wants to kill her and her friend for humiliating him. Apparently, the ex's friend mocked him or something. He said, We don't let people do things like that to us and get away with it. He started shopping for poisons, a gun, a knife, anything to get his revenge. He talked other people into helping him get these things too. So I see this getting out of hand, and the girl was a very nice girl. So I did the only thing I could and told security. I told them to keep it anonymous, because this guy is crazy, and has said many things about wanting to be a gangster and wanting to kill people. Well, those idiots fucked that up, and he ended up finding out about it. I find out from a mutual friend at some point that this guy wants to kill me. He had plans to do so, but it seemed like some people either didn't come through for him, or those friends just weren't that into the idea for some reason. Anyway, we sort of pseudo-buried the hatchet, although he did tell me many times that he could kill me himself, but he wouldn't do that because I'm his one and only true friend. I rolled my eyes, but I don't doubt he would actually try. I told him I was manipulated into telling on him. Long story. Over time, the things he said just kept getting crazier and crazier. 
If you tried to disagree with him, he would just get argumentative with tons of false facts or just continue on. Some people actually bought this stuff and were kind of like disciples to him, but I just couldn't get behind the blatant lies that a sociopath had made up. At a later point, we decided to go to a beach town to hang out, get drunk, and have fun. Yes, I was tempting fate, but back then I didn't care so much about my life, and I really needed to get out and break free from being a shut-in that never did anything. So me, him, and two other friends went to this awesome college beach party town. It's only important to mention this because one of the friends he invited along was a guy with social issues that he didn't actually know. The guy just had money, and the other guy had a car. He used these guys as a means to an end. They weren't his friends, to my surprise. At one point, the guy with the car strands us in the middle of the night when the whole town goes dead. Our cell phones died, and a drug dealer was the only hope for a ride we could get. The dealer requests we hold on to something for him in exchange for a ride, while he goes to get his granny's car. Charles makes me put it in my pocket after a bit. Looking back, he was doing everything he could to make me look even more suspicious. He had me wait in an alley. I can't remember why exactly. He said it was out of sight, but the dealer came back and said that what he was doing was fucked up. I stuck out over there in a sort of shadowy area. Looking back, if a cop drove by, they'd have detained me on the spot and then taken the drugs off my person and arrested me. Eventually, we leave, and Charles decides we should just keep the stuff the dealer handed him because he never came back anyway. So we're waiting by the gas station, and this guy literally goes up to a police officer to ask for a ride. By this time, he had taken the stuff back and forced the other guy to hold on to it, but he had assumed that the social awkward guy give it back to me by then. I'm sure he was trying to get me with that one at that point. Anyway, after we made it back, things went back to how they usually go. If I haven't mentioned it, Charles was a womanizer. He didn't care who it was. He'd go for her. He'd get with women that I thought would be impossible for anyone at all to get with. Married teachers, devout churchgoers who were in committed relationships. But he also didn't seem to have standards. He just liked to ruin people's relationships and their lives. It kind of shattered my illusions of people at the time, because it showed me that everyone could be manipulated into doing anything, and that identity and personality don't mean anything. I'm not sure, but I might have been depressed for a long time after that. Anyway, there was this girl who was a pastor's daughter. Sort of pretty. She kept to herself, mostly. Charles decided to go out with her at some point, and she entered this rebellious phase where she was sleeping around with everyone. She also didn't bathe or take care of herself. Apparently, Charles was her first. When I asked her if that was true, she proceeded to tell me horror stories about how he was manipulative and abusive towards her. One time, during a fight while they were walking back to campus, he even tried to push her into oncoming traffic. This was told to me during a period of time he had left and gone somewhere for an internship. Thankfully, I thought, because I wasn't likely to see him again. At least not for a long time. Well, I was wrong. He came back when I least expected it. He was just as fucked up as ever. I told him I thought a girl liked me once and expressed a desire to get with her. Just random conversation that I didn't think would go anywhere. I just needed to work up the nerve and do it. Upon hearing this, he goes over to her. They talk and next thing I know, they're in a relationship. This relationship lasts a few weeks, and for some reason he's told her and everyone else that I'm his cousin. Suddenly, they break up, and she's avoiding both him and me. I try to explain that I'm not like him, and that she doesn't need to be afraid of me, but she absolutely refused to be around me. If I sat at the table, all of our friends, except Charles or Aunt, she gets up and leaves. Someone asked her about it and she told them that it was because Charles was my cousin, and that he had done horrible things to her while they were together. And this scumbag did that stuff just because I liked her, and in a way, I guess it was my fault. Anyway, a few years later, circa 2012 or something, I had a new circle of friends. A guy named Ricky, another named Mike, and a girl named Karen. Ricky had a huge crush on Karen, but we all got along just fine. One day, Charles just showed up out of the blue, and tries to get Ricky to join us in our adventures or whatever the fuck. I'm really just trying to find any excuse to distance myself at this point, but I guess at this junction in my life, 
I was still way too shy to tell people off or not be afraid to speak up. Anyway, this idiot has some plan to form our own gang or something, and one day he's trying to three-way call us. I badly wanted to tell Ricky that giving him his number was a terrible idea, but I didn't want to get shot or stabbed or something. I didn't pick up the phone, and apparently they had a conversation. Later I'd find out that during their few weeks of friendship, Charles was trying to get Ricky in on a plan to lure me into some trap and kill me. He had sold Ricky a lie originally that I liked Karen. Ricky didn't seem to mind and said that he would step down, so Charles started spinning other lies. Ricky didn't go for any of it in the end, thankfully. We talked and had a long, healthy conversation about it all. Ricky is still a very good friend of me to this day. Eventually, Charles left. The last I heard from him was some voicemail from 2015 or something, I think. Hands on the creepiest person I've ever met, befriended, made an enemy of, and then had to play it cool with for years on end just to not get killed or worse. He never did admit his real name to me, by the way. He always introduced himself under false names to strangers, too. I think the story could use more detail, so feel free to ask questions in the comments about things that didn't make sense. I'll do my best to fill in the gaps. I really wanted to keep this short, and to the creepy points, at least. Back in December of 2004, it doesn't seem real. It's been almost 10 years. I was living in Portland, Oregon and attending college. I was sitting at home one night writing my last research paper for the term. I had my Yahoo Instant Messenger up, chatting to a few friends, when a message from someone who's not on my list pops up. Have you ever thought about suicide? Uh, okay, weird. But hey, it's almost midnight on a Sunday night, and stranger things have been asked to me before. Can I see your tits, etc. So I messaged the stranger back for kicks. Sure, who hasn't at some point? Why? Well, asking that question opened up Pandora's box. He battered me with questions about how I wanted to die. Why did I want to die? Would I want to die with others? Obviously getting creepier and creepier as the conversation continued. But I played along, assuming the guy was just screwing around with me. I ask him his name. He says it's Jerry, and I ask to see a picture. He sends me a profile pic on Hot or Not, and asks me if I think he's good looking. I tell him, sure, yeah, you're cute, whatever. He asks to see a picture of me. I send him a random old photo of a girl on my MySpace friends list. Yes, it's that old. I realize now. He tells me he thinks I'm a 10. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry, who is obsessed with suicide. As the conversation continues, he tells me he's sick of life, and women don't seem to be attracted to him, so he wants to just end it all. I tell him all the things you're supposed to say to people in this situation. Relationships are nothing. You're more important to the people in your life. Don't do it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not heartless, but I just don't feel like talking someone off a ledge at now 1am. Jerry tells me that he's met a lot of women online that want to kill themselves, and he's planning a party for Valentine's Day, 15 months from now, so everyone can come and do it together at his house in Klamath Falls, Oregon. He asks me if I'm interested in joining. I say, yeah, sure, but I make an excuse that I don't have a car to get down there for it. He tells me that there are a few women from Portland coming down for it, and one of them has a van. He's sure I can hitch a ride. He says he's built a beam in his home that will hold up to 50 bodies at once, but that I shouldn't wear shoes because they'll weigh me down. By now, yes. I'm starting to realize that this man is acting very serious, and this is in fact not a joke. So I start asking him specifics. What his address is, what his full name is, who are the women traveling from Portland. He tells me their names, and that one of them is even bringing her five children with her, and that they all want to die as well. Huge red flags are up at this point, so while I'm still chatting with him, 
I call a friend of mine back home in Eastern Oregon, who works as a 911 dispatcher. She's actually at work when I call her, and after telling her the whole story, she advises me to hang up and call Portland Police Department right away. At least give them the info to pass over to Klamath Falls. She makes a record in their system that I've called just in case. I keep talking to Jerry and call the Portland Police. They send two officers out about an hour later, and they pretty much just laugh at me when I explain to them what's going on. I print out our chat log, give them the guy's full name and address I've already verified through Google as being legit, as far as Google can at least, and they tell me to just quit talking to him. Simple as that and go about their business. Don't I feel stupid now? I call my friend back home and tell her what Portland PD did. She said to keep an eye on things. If he keeps talking, just keep saving the conversation. So I do. For another two hours, and things just get to the point where I can't handle him anymore. He's battering me with questions about how do I want to die, or in clothes or naked. Do I want to have sex before I go? Would I have a problem killing kids before? Would I want to hold hands with others while we hang? Finally, I just told him I'd be in touch closer to Valentine's Day. For the most part, I laughed it off with some friends, because Portland PD never got back to me about anything, so of course I assumed it ended up being a very strange prank. Fast forward. February 10th, 2005, a friend of mine calls me while I'm on campus on my way to work. They tell me some god down in Klamath Falls has been arrested for trying to set up a mass suicide pact for Valentine's Day. I'm floored. I run to my office, log into a computer, and sure enough it's everywhere on all news forums. Gerald Crane, arrested for plotting mass suicide Valentine's Day party. My friend from back home sees the news and calls me. Tells me I need to call back to the Portland PD and tell them that I called this in back in December. I make the call, and an hour later, two FBI agents are coming to pick me up at my job, taking me home and taking my entire computer to be analyzed. We sit in my living room, and I'm questioned over and over about my involvement, and if I was really planning to commit suicide. I kept telling them over and over that I just talked to the guy as a joke. I thought it was some sort of prank and that I only called the cops when he started talking about some woman from Portland bringing her kids, too. I told them I'd given all the info to the Portland PD officers back in December. How was I supposed to know that they never did anything with it? Which they didn't. They sat on it. Probably shredded it, even. Never even sent any of the info to Klamath Falls. The agents tell me that the story has gotten a lot bigger since then. Crane had contacted hundreds of people, at least 30 had agreed to come on Valentine's Day to his house and all commit suicide together. One woman, her parents found some emails between she and Crane and called the police. And that's how they finally got involved. Not from me nearly two months ago. This happened less than a week before Valentine's Day. I'm freaked out. They drop me back off at the college and I tell my boss everything that's happened. She tells me that reporters have been calling non-stop since I left, wanting to talk to me. She said she didn't give them my cell number, but that she thought it was only a matter of time before they showed up as the office. I was a student worker. My name is on the campus website and directory. If the AP got a hold of a police report, there was no saying how fast they could start tracking me down. I call my mom, tell her what's happened. She tells me she'll be up that evening to come get me and bring me home for a break. I take four days off, turn in what assignments I have left. The FBI has the rest on my tower, and I head off to Eastern Oregon to wait out the media. Big mistake. Huge. By the time I made it back home that night, they'd already tracked down my brother. My sister-in-law thought it was so cool that ABC and CNN wanted to talk to me, she gave them my parents' address and my cell phone number. She's an idiot. I was harassed, chased down, and semi-terrorized until I finally gave an interview to Good Morning America. I hoped it would just die down then. The story was out. Who cares? Wrong. Wrong. Apparently, every freaking outlet cares until you give them the 15 seconds of conversation the others didn't get. 
I had my 15 seconds of fame, and I never want to deal with that shit again. Crane is still sitting in the Salem State Hospital for his crimes of solicitation to commit murder. So, mister, have you ever thought of suicide? Let's not meet in real life. Hello. I just found this subreddit for the first time, and I loved reading everyone's stories. As it turns out, I have a terrible experience that fits in perfectly. At least I hope. It's complicated. This happened to me all the way back in middle school, and it still haunts me to this day. Strap in, because this one might be long. I was in 8th grade, and terribly lonely. I had just broken up with my significant other. People disliked me for being openly gay in a small conservative town, and my home life was, to say the very least, tragic. In an extremely vulnerable state, I was desperate for some sort of compassion. At the very minimum, at least some sort of human interaction. Then, a new kid moved into the school district. Perfect. I mean, yeah, he was kind of weird. Aside from the fact that he would flip tables and storm out of a classroom on a whim, I saw the opportunity to make a new friend with someone that didn't have any preconceived notions about me. And so I talked to him, and he talked to me. In fact, he seemed more than interested in being my friend. It was all I had ever hoped for, really. He asked for my Skype, I asked for his, and we exchanged messages every night. As it turned out, his home life wasn't perfect either. As something we could bond over. Far too soon, though, he confessed his feelings for me, and respectfully, I rejected him. I had just gotten out of a relationship, and quite frankly, I didn't like him in that type of way at all. I thought he was alright with it, but things took a huge turn. Seemingly out of nowhere, he would tell me all about how he wanted to kill himself, and describe it to me in graphic detail, every single night right before he logged off. I would stay up for hours, staring at the screen, hoping that I'd see his little icon pop up, telling me that he was okay. And if I wasn't doing that, I was lying in bed wide awake thinking about it, endlessly. Whether I would see him at school the next day or not, it was routine now, convincing him not to kill himself. One day, we're back in school, and I'm heading toward my locker. Right as I turn the corner, I see him shoving a note inside. As I'm approaching, I begin to greet him and ask what he's doing, and he runs away, full speed. Weird. I figured I'd open my locker and see what this whole ordeal was about. A note comes flying out, and as I read it, I'm overcome with a feeling of uneasiness. In short, he requested a hug by the end of the day or he would kill himself. In another one of my desperate attempts to keep my only friend alive, I did even though it left me with a terrible feeling. Soon, this was routine too. Notes in my locker, hugs by the end of the day. Eventually, the notes changed. It was no longer, or I'll kill myself. It was, or I'll kill myself and blame it on you. Out of fear, it continued. I never told anyone. In fact, I ripped up every note I received and threw them straight in the trash. I wish I could tell you why. I'm not sure what I was thinking. But one day I decided enough was enough and that I would keep a few. I showed them to the guidance counselor. They would do something, surely. I mean, they did. Not enough, though, certainly. They took him out of my classes, told him he was no longer allowed to interact with me. But that was all they did. I blocked him. I avoided him at all costs, even at play rehearsal. He began texting random classmates, asking if they knew where I lived. After I found this out, I never slept. I would go days without sleeping, too scared to fall asleep, thinking that he was watching me and waiting for me. Nothing happened except for my ever-growing paranoia. Anyways, we had a play to put on soon, right? And so we did. And he messed up his line. He stormed off stage. As it turns out, he ran straight into the highway, trying to throw himself in front of a car. You know, to kill himself. Luckily, the administrators got to him first. And when he was brought back into the school, he locked himself in the janitor's closet for the rest of the performance. We all figured that he wouldn't be performing the next night. They would call the cops, send him away, 
literally do anything about what just happened. They didn't. And so I saw him the next night, and we performed for the last time. I still felt uneasy, but all was well. There was even a little cast party in the cafeteria afterwards. At this point, I had acquired a few new friends. Ones that even knew about the entire situation. Friends that wanted to protect me. It felt nice finally having someone to support me. About halfway through the cast party, I leave the cafeteria to go to the bathroom. As I'm walking down the hall, I see one of my friends sobbing against the wall. She tells me that she was crying because he had threatened her, all because she was friends with me. I've never blacked out from rage before, and I don't remember storming up to him and screaming, but I guess I did. When I came back to, all I could remember was his fist flying towards my face. I swear everything that happens next is straight out of a movie. Someone jumped in front of me and took the hit. Their glasses came flying off their face, and I watched them slide across the floor. He screamed bloody murder and came at me again. I jumped over the poor person that had saved me and ran for my life. He was right behind me. Down the hall. Take a left. Run some more. Turn right. Another left. All the while he screams and screams and screams telling me he's going to kill me murder me. I feel his hands on the back of my neck, reaching out for me. He tells me he's going to choke me out, watch me die. I turn another corner. All of a sudden, I hear his body ram into the front door of the school. I slow down and watch him run out into traffic again. I'm sobbing and shaking, still convinced he might come back and try to kill me once more. I resume running and take shelter in a bathroom stall. A few minutes later, I hear the announcements crackle on. Lockdown. I run all the way back to the cafeteria crying to seek help, to not be locked out of the safe space, knowing he might still be lurking and trying to find me. As I reached the door, I tried to open it. Not only was it locked, but the students and teachers had barricaded it with numerous objects. I banged on the entrance and screamed. I don't remember anything after that. All I know is that eventually they let me in, and I never saw him again. I was left with no information of what happened to him. No police reports, no investigations, just pure radio silence.